Vamos a empezar ya. So we're going to start off. Entonces, bueno, yo supongo que ya estamos todos... So I suppose we're all already back in the main room. So I'm just going to start off by sharing my screen with all of you. Tienes que elegir lo que, que sí, compartir, ¿no? Este, sí, quiero poner esta. ¿Esta? This is the one I want to choose. Just a second. Bien. Ok. So let me just put this somewhere that it doesn't bother me. Maybe just over here. There we go. I don't know if I can move it around. Okay, there it goes. So, for those of you who don't know uh, uh, about it, the IFSU Resource Finder is uh, the application or tool that uh, it's going to uh, help uh, people search through uh, keywords, different satsangs and audios from Guru Rush. So, for example, if submission and you look for resources uh, within this that talk about this kind of subject. For example, in this case, we have the second coming. But in this case, like if it was uh, the, the the cards, we have them all exposed. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna I'm gonna just uh, spin it around and see where it stops. And within those uh, one, two, three, four, five, six uh, satsangs, there are a few that I know. Uh, healing. I don't know. We can choose one of these. So let's choose, for example, this this same one, giving up all attachments. And I go to the transcript and I grabbed a paragraph. So I grab this paragraph and now I'm going to uh, start with this uh, paragraph. <laughs> I'm going to just uh, place it here. This is the first uh, card and the other four cards have been already placed here so we can uh, uh, go faster. So we don't know what's, what we're going to listen to. We don't know the content. And I'll, I'll make some kind of uh, interpretation from this. And afterwards, we'll open microphone to see if there's something to be said. And like that, we'll do with the rest of the cards that will be exposed. Just a second, just a second. Ah, no, y aquí me ha salido otro app, pues que lo tenía de... de no, es que esto tengo que hacer, share fragment. So I, I need to do it in a different way. So I have to share the fragment, not the, the full video. Uh, okay. Oh, so I cannot grab this fragment. So this card can, does not want to be choked, picked. So let's pick another card. Let's just... So somebody say stop for now. Individual blessings would be good. Emotional attachments I've chosen. So uh, emotional attachments uh, was a question by Melissa. 
and I'm going to grab the first uh, paragraph to up to the second. Share this fragment. Now it's copied. And therefore now I can uh, just go on into YouTube and let me just uh, put the subtitles on in Spanish and we can now listen to the fragment. What is the nature of emotional attachments? So that also implies that if there are emotional attachments, there can be emotional non-attachments. We have discussed before that everything is governed by the law of opposites. But emotional attachments in daily living is just as hurtful as emotional non-attachments. So we have to find a middle road. The nature of emotional attachments is because of a certain need. An emotional attachment, say a man to a woman or a woman to a woman or whichever way around you want to put it, is because one uses the other as a crutch. Hmm? For example, people as householders, married people, and I don't know about others, that indulge in coitus, that make love, hmm? they do make love because of an emotional attachment. Therefore, the act of making love uh, does not assume because as soon as they are done with, the attachment emotionally in the sexual sense disappears for a time being. And that is why you find many husbands turning around and sleeping on their backs, on the sides rather. Hmm? Now that is the time when you want to be more closer to your wife, not turn your back. <coughs> so do you see the attachment, you know, the emotion that welled up within you is so fleeting? Hmm? And if it is so fleeting, what is the use of it? It just becomes a biological function, a release, like going to the toilet. So, these attachments, if they are brought to the middle level between non-emotional attachment and emotional attachment, then you'd find a greater balance in the very act. And this balance would assume the proportion of total relaxation. It could become a kind of meditation. Many people indulge uh, uh, in the sex act for exhaustion and not relaxation. That's why the guy or the woman turns around and falls asleep. Literally speaking, you should not be falling asleep. You should feel alive and more closer to the one which you think you love. So, how does one reach that stage, that middle road between attachment and non-attachment? Because the very physical act hmm, is an attachment in itself. 
but can that attachment be more refined? There lies the crux of the problem. Can it be more refined? Yes, it can. I talk of experience. It can be more refined if you have in your heart one thought deeply felt and emotionally stirred in your heart that the person that I am close to is a goddess. Every part of her, every pore in her skin is tinged with divinity and she is truly my goddess and she feels the same that he is truly my god and with that kind of emotion you'd find attachment disappearing and the middle road is there where there is a conjunction of two bodies and yet the two physical bodies assume the proportion of divine bodies they assume the proportion of divinity being manifested and brought down to its gross physical equivalent for even the body is permeated all the time by divinity so who's making love to who? God is making love to God and it's two aspects the male and the female because both converge for divinity is neutral but because of manifestation one is a woman and the other is a man and these polarities are necessary. Really speaking, we can't call them polarities either. They're complementary. Like in electricity, the positive current uh, and the negative current, they are not opposing each other, but they are complementary to each other to produce the light. So, when we find this complementariness between man and woman, then we find neither attachment nor attachment. Um, so, how I'm going to go back to the share option. de compartir un momento que estoy intentando ver cómo dejo de compartir porque como he quitado uh, I, I just want to stop sharing the screen bueno pues eh, so do you want to start uh, Fernando oh thank you I'm going to start uh, by saying that we've, we've always said in all the courses and, and satsangs of Guru Raj that the conversation with Guru Raj had a, a, a kind of underlining that you could kind of feel in the air. So I wonder what, what, uh, what you were thinking when this video has come out i said it in it like like a joke but it, it's a very complicated video uh, i minimally feel reflected by how far uh, we we are from a matureness at an emotional level and how much we have to learn about equilibrium that we systematically uh, uh, 
have been told by Guru Raj that uh, has been taught by him that opposites are not uh, contradictory, that it's an equilibrium from attachment and non-attachment. He does not want us to forget that there is attachment. He wants us to go from non-attachment, from attachment to non-attachment, but without forgetting there is some attachment. And I feel that is something uh, just absolutely marvelous from the teachings of Guru Raj, that it does not discredit uh, anything in any way. He invites us to uh, look the center from ourselves looking over this clip which is a very complicated uh, theme i, I was i was uh, filming it. i uh, i i have to admit that i've never really gone through this subject uh, completely in my mind and going through this uh, subject which has been in the course of teachers uh, Po two, the ones that uh, are giving the course Po two, uh, it has come out uh, one more time. In this case, relationships. I remember that Guru Raj uh, always used to say uh, that love always was attached and non-attached. And he used to put many examples. One of them, for example, used to be this monk, which is this uh, short story from India. So they, they found this woman who abandoned this child because, uh, you know, he didn't have a husband. So he, he, the monk took in the child in a little kind of a cottage in, a, in the middle of nowhere uh, because the woman left him there. So the monk took care of him, he, he took him to school, you know, he took care of him. And when he grew up and he was a good man and he was a respected man, he worked, you know, uh, he went to university and worked. And uh, he, the woman came back and he said, oh, you know, this, this kid is mine, so you, you have to give me back the kid. So, and he gave it back and so he was attached to the person uh, while he was taking care of him, but uh, he was not attached at the time of uh, giving him away. So me and Fernando were uh, kind of uh, commenting about strategies and expectations, you know, that we have, that we have to somehow plan our ways, you know, if you want to get somewhere, you know, you have to plan your way through to get there. But whatever the result is, you have to kind of forget about it. You know, you do whatever you have to do. And in some way to say, let the rest be in God's hand. In another way of saying, he's saying like, you know, you, you water a plant, but you cannot do much more. The plant grows by itself. How do we come to this situation of uh, attachment and non-attachment at the same time? In this example where he's talking about a, a marriage. And he said the secret is to see God, a goddess in your, in your wife. Uh, the secret is to realize everything that surrounds you is God and what is true is if you focus that in a one person and it can be your wife Gurash always said it it can be your your God or your guru because you know sometimes it's easier with a guru because a, a husband is difficult to see as a God because, you know, he gives you many troubles. But if you can actually get to see everything as God and see your wife 
uh, as a goddess or and vice versa uh, or like uh, Guru uh, said in the satsang wife with wife and man with men or however that relation is about to come up uh, just getting to know another human being is something beautiful because uh, each human has that uh, evolution process behind them and it's an expression of divinity and it, it's the son uh, meeting the father we're all the sons so with this what i try to say is that you can see divinity in any person you have next to you and when we say uh, i we refer to is is much better thy is much better you than i because when you say i you 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 associate it to your little i you know to to the to the mind process that you are attached because he's the one you're listening to from first thing in the morning so when people say i uh, it's much better to say you because then you you know you, you won't get wrong you become object you know which the 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 i real self which is the same as in a dog you know is the same is the same form of evolution as myself or yourself is the same real i expressing through different uh, evolution processes but it's the same i so you can see that same i in in even your dog because uh, it's all the same i expressing through the different expressions throughout this evolution said this uh, we're, if, if anybody wants to say anything else in addition to this video you can uh, put your put your hand up or we can just go to the next video or or you can just uh, unmute your mic no if nobody wants to say nothing let's go on to the next video from the ones we have randomly chosen like if they were cards this, this one is already prepared yesterday Doug spoke to us of our task on the course as being that of making ourselves receptive to shakti or grace what does it mean to be receptive to grace can we do anything to open ourselves to it or can we only respond to grace once received yes good question um, <clears throat> the basis of the question really is what is a grace how can something indefinable really be defined but one could use analogies to explain it it is like a plant growing and there are forces in nature and beyond nature, which brings the right amount of minerals to it, the right amount of sun to it, the right amount of water to it, to make the plant grow. Now, what is that factor that brings all these things about in its proper combination, in its right combination, for we know too much fertilizer could kill the plant? Now, that factor that brings about the proper combination is grace. When man understands grace with his mind, he does not know what grace is. Grace is a force, a power. We call it Guru Shakti. Grace is a force, a power that the mind cannot understand, but it can be experienced within. 
Now, experiencing this grace within, man still needs to translate it outwardly. And the only means he has to translate it or have some inkling of it is his mind. So, that which is experienced inside has to be brought to a conscious level of the thinking mind. Now, how does this happen? What are the mechanics? When a person experiences grace, he always tries to find an object for the grace, or otherwise he looks for a mirror in which he would view that grace flowing through him in the mirror. Now, everything in this world is a mirror. Everything in this world is a mirror in which we look at ourselves. Do we look at it clearly in its true value or do we allow our own personal experiences to influence what we see? Therefore, the old saying, beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder. To one person a certain object might seem so ugly, while to another person it might seem so, so beautiful. So, the mind, the conscious mind and the subconscious mind act as filters through which grace flows through for Without grace, you could not even see. So, man influences the purity of grace by the experiences, the patterning and conditioning of his own mind. And that is why different people would have a totally different perspective of any object in view. And yet, grace is working all the time for nothing else exists in this universe but grace, that force, that spiritual force, that spiritual power. Now, how to allow the purity of grace to shine through, one has to clarify the mind. It is like a dirty pane of glass that has to be cleaned up so that true light could come through. Uh, grace is like a crystal and whatever you put, the crystal assumes the color. Now, if you put a red flower behind a crystal, the crystal would seem red, yellow flower, it would seem yellow. So all these various colors of life are seen through the prism of one's mind. In reality, grace or the true color is only white. But because of the prism, we view it differently in the colors of the spectrum. Now, like that, although grace and that spiritual force, the kingdom of heaven, whatever label you wish to put on it, is there all the time the mind blocks its passage. Now, what can we do to allow the grace to flow in its primal purity? This would involve clarifying the mind. How do we clarify the mind? The mind is clarified of its sanskaras or its impressions and patternings by having an understanding of things. Hmm? And that is why we have these satsangs and these causes, so that we could look at a particular thing with a different perspective, from a different angle. Most people go through life with blinkers like a horse would do, and he could only see in one direction and loses all that which is around him. Hmm? So here, to allow grace its fullest scope, one needs this awareness. Now, there are two ways of becoming more aware. Hmm? 
more unfolded, though awareness is there already. For if it is not there, you could never achieve it. So actually, and in reality, it is not an achievement. It is not something which you gather from outside and add on to yourself. It is there all the time. So to have a better perspective of life, to be more aware, one needs spiritual practices and understanding. The greatest spiritual practice, as I've mentioned yesterday, I think, is Guru Shakti, a grace to tune oneself consciously by the mind at first, by thought at first, that there is a greater force beyond us. And every theology, every religion, every philosophy does acknowledge the fact that there is a power greater than us. And that power, call it God or grace. Well, so for me, what this video suggests is the obvious need of grace in in our life. That is something that not all the time is clear. Uh, that through through his comprehensions, his teachings, and his his presence. Uh, but uh, with that, we couldn't take it to the end. We, our mission, our objective is to take care of our garden and of our lives, and do it with love. And but we're also waiting. Uh, for that garden to be blooming with flowers and and uh, butterflies come uh, flying to our garden, and in that sense, those uh, butterflies that come to our garden are um, are that grace, uh, and to adapt that teaching to to our human lives. Uh, uh, we never know when this this uh, fact is going to happen. We must just be prepared for for if there are guests to come, uh, we will be able to host them. So in the same way, grace appears when whenever, and you just must be ready. I remember that uh, Saint uh, pa uh, Pablo's in in a letter. He comments uh, not only by the deeds uh, of the works, you can reach uh, the Father, but you would also need the grace of the Holy Spirit. And I think that this is a very important uh, thing to remember, because when we're completely submerged in this world of uh, information, spiritual information, very frequently, uh, we we forget about this uh, subject. Uh, we've also been spoken about this with Ramon. Uh, for example, in this uh, uh, PhD from Harvard, that he will never touch something like grace in his speeches. Uh, sometimes, what uh, surrounds uh, by meditation uh, from from the sources we know does not actually touch this kind of subject. Uh, maybe someone who has become enlightened at a very young age and that uh, can explain uh, in a different way because they are capable of uh, explaining to this depth. But we have, as the, as the best gift of all, uh, Guru Shakti as uh, one of our uh, key tools. After many years of meditating with Guru Raj and, and learning all the techniques, 
one of the biggest gifts that we have obtained is Guru Shakti. I mean, all of the words that uh, Guru Raj uh, gave us were very enlightening. And sometimes I even want to upload the videos because they, they're, they're emotional each time I listen to them. Because, uh, uh, but the Guru Shakti was a way of giving me access to that Shakti, to that grace. So for me, that, this is the most important. Well, for me in this video, I would point out maybe two, two main things. One, that question that he brings out, to be open to that grace, not to not block that grace. Let's say the grace are analogies, but you know, when Einstein was just about the constant uh, of the universe, if you change a, a decimal, uh, 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 this will not all be possible. So I would say the grace is that exact proportion that is exact for this to be possible. So how that uh, neutral energy which is very abstract, which is like falling in love with an equation. You, you have to be a mathematician. What is it that you need? One is obviously the meditation techniques and the comprehension that you get through the, through the satsangs we get. And this is something uh, very important, which is why we have been working a lot of people behind from Sutriya, which has done all the cataloging of, uh, of all the satsangs, to Benito, who has done the transcripts. So all those satsangs and all of those uh, courses and all those uh, lectures that Guru Raj gave us are there now and can be, uh, you know, uh, used like an oracle, like we're doing today. Neither Fernando or I knew what was going to come out in these videos. We have uh, uh, chosen all of the other ones, like we chose this one before. But I think it's very important uh, that to let you know that this is one of the things that we're going to give access to everyone in the platform, to all of this uh, spiritual knowledge and uh, all of those techniques that are, are inherited by that knowledge. Because uh, the, the teachings of Guru Raj go further than the techniques, they are, they are much denser. Uh, the, the, the big teachings are the satsangs and the, the change or perspective that you get uh, uh, that let you see things from a new perspective which give you peace and eventually you stop seeing yourself out there and start seeing yourself within the God areas outside which is the same God inside. So why Guru Shakti is such a big gift? Because to understand that grace uh, with, a mind, with a human mind, uh, we have to understand God through another human mind. And those satsangs allow you to connect through that uh, mind of Guru Rash. And, and that was that sum up of all those uh, evolutions. Therefore, that connection with Guru Raji's mind that uh, the satsangs provide give us a focal point to connect with that self, but not yourself, but, you know, you can get lost with the language 
because if you say yourself, you know, you think you're talking about I, and it's not the case. It, it, it's better to think that it's him, it's him acting through you. But only only a human mind can connect with a human mind, because you are a human, and that is your form. You know, if we were cows, uh, you know, our gods would be cows. But our gods are humans because we are humans. And well said this. Unless anybody wants to comment or add any kind of thing to this uh, card. You can raise your hand and we shall move on. Sandra? Yes, hi Ramon, how are you? Uh, my question to you is... Uh, Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, my question is, gr uh, is grace like a, a state of being that you achieve? La pregunta de Sandra es eh, si es la gracia un estado del ser que, eh, que consigues like you achieve it with your practice with your meditation or like when you are when you are chanting sometimes you have the glimpse of the you know those millisecond when you feel that divinity or you feel that connection with divinity so there will be a state of being so is there a state of grace mm -hmm. eh, eh, sandra dice eh, ese, esos momentos que a lo mejor meditando durante el chant Tienes esos momentos donde sientes esa gracia, sientes ese estado. Eh, me pre pregunta si es un estado del ser, es algo que se consigue a través de las prácticas. So, eh, eh, I will answer in Spanish and Giroud will translate in English. Bien, ¿tú quieres contestar tú? Sí. You want to answer, uh, Fernando? I... I think grace occupies everything. It's like saying water for a fish. And we, we're in the middle of that grace, like that fish being in the middle of the water. So we cannot uh, uh, die of thirst. It's not a, a state that you reach because you refine uh, yourself. Uh, it's more uh, the other way uh, around. When you refine that level, you f you find out that everything that's around you, the air that you breathe, everything is grace. So, for example, you, you breathe the air, but you don't see it. So the grace, in the same way, in, in each breath, in each uh, uh, atom, it's grace acting. So it's not a state. I would add on just simply there are two very important things that Guru Raj teached. It's not something that you reach, it's something that you add on. It's something that is there and you open up to receive. So you don't block your mind to receive grace. But grace is what keeps your molecules together and, and by keeping all of those molecules together, you are uh, understanding experience from that individual perspective, as you call Sandra. But uh, same as my dog has the same molecules and the same grace is uh, giving uh, the expression of that evolution. So we're all forms of uh, evolution. Uh, so if you pull back in the string of the evolution, the evolution is very long. And at, at, this, is, this is not about going back in your evolution, but to understand because the evolution takes its own place. It's just to become aware this evolution is taking 
place is also grace expressing everything and it's what's happening at that taken stage there's only one real eye with the second eye but with that self having a consciousness of yourself you know uh, the best way is to give in to you to a, to another uh, like this great uh, teacher from the monks uh, that said while there's an eye let me give in to you so that's why guru shakti he takes place uh, you know the best is to see uh, have a, a symbol to allow you to see how to connect to that second so that grace is already happening you're just not going to block it because you're attached to yourself so maybe yourself is thinking things should be in a certain way and then for you not seeing how they really are you know so you must love what it is you know you know the, the shakti or grace is already is it's already anybody else Hi, guys. Thank you very much, uh, Sandra, for your question. Thank you, Mary. Um, I, I don't, uh, you had said that, um, that we can block grace. And I'm not quoting you, Ramon, but I don't, I think grace is like the gentleman said, it yes, is, the, it is everything. Let me translate you. Eh, eh, tú has dicho, aunque no te estoy citando exactamente, que puedes bloquear a la gracia. Continue. Okay. Um, uh, I think grace is everything. It, it, there, 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 there is no separation of you and grace. There is no realization of grace. Grace just is. It permeates every living thing all of our realization everything that exists is grace so to realize grace is just realizing a label let to me, something let me translate that bueno mary está diciendo i'm summarizing obviously that's fine mary está diciendo que no se puede separar la gracia del yo porque la gracia es lo único que está existiendo, lo único que está ocurriendo y por lo tanto no puede separarla ni de la existencia del pequeño yo, obviamente que no la puede separar. So continue. Yeah, I just again just the there you can you can label things that does not mean that they started to exist when you labeled them. Eh, podemos poner etiquetas a las cosas, pero eso no significa que las cosas empiecen a existir cuando las etiquetamos. Grace permeates everything, living and non-living. La everything... gracia permea todo, vivo y no vivo. Grace just is. There isn't any realization to grace. Eh, la can... gracia simplemente es. No hay ningún darse cuenta de la gracia. You can have a mental realization of grace, but that does not mean that grace did not exist before your mental interpretation of it. Eh, en otras palabras, tú puedes tener una interpretación mental de la gracia, pero eso no significa que la gracia no estuviera ahí antes de tu propia interpretación mental. Everything is God. Todo es Dios. There is no separation. Everything no is God. Separación. No hay ninguna separación. Todo es Dios. Thank you very much, Mary. Muchas Thank gracias, you. Mary. Alguien más o vamos a la siguiente carta. Is there anybody else or shall we go to the next card? So, uh, grace and God is the same thing? God and grace is the same thing? Yeah, we could say yes. 
Okay, now we could go into catechism on, on, on how the different languages are, are used, but we don't need to, to go into that depth. So he said, Father, is it the Holy Spirit uh, or is it the Son? And who was first and, and who is the permanent and who is the transcendent? We can go into that, but it's not so important because experience will teach you this kind of uh, knowledge because it's something undefiable and and you, you know you but it's something that you can experience even though you cannot define it so uh, to be let's say when they say you are in a state of grace you're in a state of gratitude i would like to add on the experience of divinity we have to make it uh, understandable so we kind of uh, downsize it to make concepts and in that sense uh, the the grace of god is is the same so but it's very useful to have the the father the son and the holy spirit because it allows us to comprehend the different experiences but obviously we're talking about the same thing is it the grace and God? Is it the same thing? The direct answer is yes, but what we do is downsize these concepts so we can assimilate. So we're going to go on into the next uh, uh, card. So we choose here the next card. And the next card is this one, from word, uh, deed, and thought. What is the meaning of speech, thought, and action? Ah, very good, very good. <coughs> The American people are very verbose. <coughs> they could say one sentence hmm, which they try to say in 50 sentences. So when a question comes concisely there's greater beauty to it. Because if you know what you want to say, you can do it in a very concise manner. What is the difference between speech, word and, and action? All three factors are totally interrelated because the word brings about speech and the speech brings about action and also the other way around because action could guide your speech An action could guide your thought as well. But now what comes first? That is the question. It starts with thought. And where does thought originate? Thought originates only from your past experiences. Any uh, recognition of any object or subject normally starts with thought. And that thought has its origination in your past karmas and your past sanskaras. That influences your thinking processes. 
And by being influenced by your past experiences, your thinking processes takes a different turn altogether. Two people or five people or ten people might view an object hmm? and yet the interpretation of the object will be different because of their past experiences. So you are governed by your past experiences. The whole idea is to clarify those past experiences. Now what do we mean by clarification? Clarification means not to be involved in the past experiences that govern your thoughts. Past experiences has to be wiped out. And that brings one to mental clarity. Because, as I've said in so many lectures, I lecture around the world. Because past experiences are governing your life. And not giving you the experience of this very moment. So you're living in the past. Uh, Hmm. And then that past is projected into the future and the present is forgotten. Where are you now? Tell me, where are you? Sitting in this hall? You're not. Because even while you're listening to a holy man, your mind is floating somewhere else. You're thinking of the next dinner. You're thinking of what dress you're going to wear tomorrow. You're thinking of the kids at home, perhaps, hmm? if you have any. And you're thinking of things which are not relevant to this moment now. Laura's thinking of the next painting she's going to do. Hmm? Jeff is thinking of what lessons he's going to give to his art classes. So the mind gets divided and it is the division that produces conflicts. Hmm? Our six foot four friend sitting over there huh? is thinking what property he's going to sell next week. <laughs> And that is how the mind works. But to have the mind in total stillness, in total concentration, will lead you to greater contemplation. And contemplation is like pouring oil from one a vessel into the other without any break. That constitutes contemplation. So the relation of thought with all its 
forces that might be hmm, can be a very valuable factor in a person's life. And it can also be very disturbing or detrimental. Now, how do we get rid of this? It's only one way to have the proper method of meditation. <laughs> ah. And that must be personally prescribed by a true spiritual master. Otherwise, books can give you nothing. It is not only the practices that are given to you, but the spiritual force that's imparted to you by a true spiritual master. And that brings the togetherness of the mind. Twelve billion cells in this two and a half pound brain. Hmm? Twelve billion cells and you're only using one millionth of twelve billion cells. So how much concentrated are you? That you ask yourself. So, this is the background of your present thinking. And when your thinking becomes right through spiritual practices, huh, then your actions will become right. Your actions must become right and proper, pure, without even thinking about it. It must be spontaneous. Hmm? And spontaneity is the secret of proper action. And you will know for sure that your actions will always be right, automatically. Then you do not concentrate on action anymore. Because then no concentration is required. Uh, you just act. You come to a fork on the road and uh, there is something within you that will take you, make you take the right turn instead of the wrong one. So, proper thinking will make you more intuitive. Hmm? You step away from the analytical mind to the intuitional mind, from the left hemisphere to the right hemisphere. Hmm? And the right hemisphere is connected to your spiritual self. And that spiritual self is an inner voice. The little birdie, you heard the story, huh? That automatically takes you and makes your mind take you in the right direction. 
So what I'm trying to say is this, that the thinking processes and the action and of course speech connected to it, because thought is nothing else but expressed in speech. Do you know something that although you might be sitting quietly, your mind is speaking? Huh? Perhaps not vocally, but your mind is chattering away inside you all the time. Now through spiritual practices, you stop the chatter. Hmm? For what does chatter matter? Huh? So when we gain control of the chattering of the mind, uh, our actions assume a different quality. Hmm? A husband kisses his wife, or a boyfriend kisses the girlfriend, and vice versa, of course. You can't do it alone. It takes two to tango. Where does the response come from? Where does the closeness come from? Hmm? It comes only totally when the mind stops chattering. At that moment in that co close embrace, you don't think I'm kissing my woman or my man, hmm? it becomes a natural flow. Hmm? And in that natural flow, hmm, you forget yourself and she forgets herself. Hmm? And then it becomes a flow. And in that flow, the two of you glow. And that is the way how action should be. Hmm? All action in life should never be premeditated. Just let it flow. Does the river premeditate? Huh? From the start to the middle to the end? It does not. It just flows. Even over rocks and stones and boulders and driftwood and you name it. Hmm? And even over the pollutions uh, hmm? that most rivers contain, because I know of people that uh, do those things. Why not go to the toilet to have a pee instead of in the river? So let life not be polluted by wrong thinking, which produces wrong speech, which in turn translates itself into wrong action. I'm using these simple analogies uh, to give you the philosophy of life. 
And when you understand the simple open secrets, your life will become happier. And that is the duty which I'm doing. Well, why must I travel thousands and thousands of miles to come and speak to you? Hmm? Because I would like to see people's life becoming more joyous, not pleasurable, no. Pleasure is nothing. You have pleasure today and you'll have pain tomorrow, because one balances the other. But joy is something different. I once knew a girl whose name was Joy. But unfortunately, she was not really joyful. It's my fault, really, because I did not fill her. To live up to her name of joy. So therefore, she was not joyful. So, the point is this, be full of joy. And it is not difficult at all, not at all. The spiritual path people regard to be difficult. But it is so easy, really. Hmm? You put your mind to it, if you have one. <laughs> no. To find real joy in life, is uh, not to put your mind to it, but to have no mind, as the Zen people say. Hmm? To have no mind. R get rid of the chattering. Hmm? in the mind, uh, and then you will feel the joy that wells up in your heart, and enjoy that joy. And when you enjoy that joy, and the mind is reawakened, it will transmute itself to the mind where cognition comes and you feel and you know of that real joy that lies in your heart. Now, to feel is fine. To feel, to have emotions, are mental qualities. But you cannot, as long as you have a body, excuse me, you know, change of weather and traveling from country to country. <coughs> you do catch a bit of a cold, you know? <coughs> so when you open up the heart, 
and transmute the joyousness of the heart to the mind, then only will you feel, have the feelings and the emotions of the joy that the heart has transmitted. And this is what is called cognition or recognizing what is really in you. And that is how the 12 billion cells of your brain can be opened up. And when they are opened, you become more and more aware of everything around you. Hmm? Now you are sitting in this room. Okay, a very simple question. How many exit signs are here in this room without looking around? Tell me. How much have you been aware? Sorry, four, not six. <laughs> you see, to be aware. How many hair have you got on your head? <laughs> six. <laughs> I can tell you, I can tell you, 24,038. And if you do not believe me, start counting. <laughs> Well, this is a great example of the marvelous uh, teachings Guru Raj gave uh, through what it seems to be a very simple question, but once it, it, it takes you through that question, it gives you to some individual uh, uh, facts that are, are amazing. He does a deconstruction of, of how he humans uh, live a, 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 a life and then he gives us tools to to take care of that life these minutes of video uh, would be what i would love to take to a desert island uh, for example because th this would be a great manual for for life Uh, for me to give a, a little addition to what's been said, that concept uh, of giving a jump to what's unknown, because, uh, you know, if the memories of what you have of yourself and how you project them into your future is what you know, and maybe the unknown is uh, just living what you have to live by forgetting that that identity and maybe that is that 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 is the unknown you know that dialogue that is constant there and if we could ignore completely that and we would be in front of what we have uh, in front of us in a day to live that is that is the great unknown and sometimes that guidance, uh, you know, to, to give sense to our lives is what a lot of people fear because, you know, people fear not controlling their future, their direct future. So that, that's the kind of uh, composition 
that he's been giving us in a heritage way, you know, the, the, the small eye is that animal receiving uh, those structures. So Guruj gave this clear uh, teaching that you have to let go of that mental dialogue now or, or after, but you have to learn to ignore it at, at least. And, you know, the, the meditation techniques is the way to get rid of it, you know. And this is what we learn when we are teaching meditation or, or when you learn meditation from a teacher. But it's, it's not just the techniques that you do in the morning or the afternoon, but that approximate you know, that uh, becoming close to our actions, to our words, to our deeds. But nothing else to say. At the end is coming back to what's blocking you from that grace. It's, it's, it's not uh, something that is blocking you, it's, it's you projecting yourself into the past and future which is the reality that you wake up in the morning and you consider that real and that becomes real and we're looking for actuality which is the present moment you're living and if you're looking at, at only your memories you're obviously looking at a curtain that you have imposed over yourself and that's what you're looking at in that moment and that curtain is the reality that you have to live, not the reality that is the actuality, which would be walking into the unknown and letting things happen. For me, it's, it's, it's funny that the, the analogy of uh, relationships come, up, come about again and how flowing with that relationship, you're becoming one with that uh, couple in the moment you, you stop giving that attachment to that person, uh, that uh, self projected in that person, or at least for a few seconds, that grace comes. Well, that's for me. Uh, if anybody wants to say anything else uh, about that section, uh, so if anybody wants to say anything, he, he, oh, Mary wants to say something. I'm just going to talk all day today. Um, I, I want he he touched on contemplation. Can you give an explanation of contemplation? Podrías dar una explicación de la contemplación, Fernando? That's a very difficult way thing to ex explain how you experience contemplation. It's that instant that uh, fulfills a uh, thought. Uh, we live it when we practice meditation uh, very profoundly. In our meetings, when we do Saturday uh, Saturday meetings, you're invited, Mary. Uh, we we experiment contemplation. If not, you know, you can talk with Irma or Lole or any. Uh, I don't know how we do it, but every Saturday at six o'clock uh, European time, we this is what we're experimenting definitely. To give a little addition, or, or it's what I uh, expand in my teachings, uh, the mind has uh, two states, or neuroscientists uh, talk about, which is the, the, the talkative part of the mind, you know, that uh, you get involved by maintaining and perpetuating that identity, the creative state of the mind, which is when you are uh, focusing your mind on a creative side, like painting a drawing or 
creating poetry, the meditative state, when you simply center yourself in that cognitive state where, where cognition takes place and less, leave the rest objects pass through. So the meditation uh, state of the mind and the contemplation state of the mind, which is uh, when the mind flows from a uniform state. For example, Guru Raj used to say, if you throw oil uh, on top of another oil vase, it's a continuous uh, flow of uh, movement. For example, contemplate a sunset and your mind is just flowing in the colors that are changing and how the shapes are changing and in your mind there is nothing else except that thing that is happening or you contemplate a poetry or you contemplate a drawing or you contemplate your favorite song so you're con completely contemplating that song because you're listening to every single vibration of the song. So you're flowing with what's happening. So, you know, the little eye is not involved. It's just your favorite song. And it's three minutes and you listen to that favorite song. And you're able to... But, you know, you can't be interrupted by all your needs. You know, maybe you need to do dinner or whatever. So... That's the little eye trying to survive and not allowing you to flow within that moment of listening to that song, which is not relevant to making dinner. So the capability of being able to flow in that uh, uh, contemplative state is from the, from the experience point of view. what you can do to have a joyful life to have a, a, a life of uh, joy and happiness uh, but the the contemplation is that state of mind which is uh, flowing through a subject or what's happening for example studying is a way of contemplating when you're reading a, a, a book and you cannot even hear the sound of the door because you're so submerged into the reading, that means you're contemplating this, uh, the, this book. And at the same time, you can contemplate an idea that you have. You can contemplate uh, anything that happens in front of you. So basically, contemplation is being in the moment. More than being in the moment is this is being expressed in the moment, but like uh, if we use the contemplation as a state of mind and compare it to the chatty speaking that of mind and comparing it to the creative state you know the mind normally would be in the speaking state you know and if you're thinking on family problems you direct yourself into you to your mother you direct your thoughts to your son or if it's work you direct it to work or whatever and if it's politics well politics to whatever governor has given you problems that time definitely what it means is that movement of thought that's that speaking uh, point of view that is trying to perpetuate in the future and when you're in a contemplation state you're using the mind in a creative way you know uh, you know like creating art or receiving art because you you, you contemplate a beautiful uh, sunset and you know to be able to paint it you have to contemplate that sunset first to be able to see all the colors so there's no future and there's no past there's uh, 
When the mind is in contemplation, there's no future or past. There is just what you're contemplating. From that perspective, has to be in the moment, but in the defining, uh, contemplating state, uh, where you could uh, differ from the meditative state. Uh, because in meditative state, when the when the sunset comes, you also discard it as unreal. So there is a cognitive side, uh, because when you're in the meditative state, uh, and to respect to the uh, to the mental chatter, and to defer those three states of mind. I call it the television mind, uh, state of mind. That's the one we use because we have a lot of reality shows in Spain. And it's like a reality show, watching it all the time uh, when you're listening to your mind. Anybody wants to say anything else? Can, can I say something? Okay, I'm going to say something in... in um... The best way that I could describe it, Mary, is like when you are outside in nature and you hear the birds and you just put your attention on the sound of the birds. So your awareness is going into the flow, into that appreciation of that. And you don't even notice that your thoughts are starting to float away. Your mind is no longer thinking. It's listening, it's tuning in, and it's just like, there's no thoughts there. It's just being, yeah, it is present in that, but it's like being in that. Muchas gracias, Irma. Eh, ah, voy a traducir a Irma, eh, pero claro, es que pff, es difícil traducir porque no me acuerdo bien. Sí, <laughs> bueno, sí. Es, 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 tú. Sí, <laughs> sí es, eh. Ah, ¿lo digo en español? Sí, sí. Ah, vale, sí, traduce. Ok, <laughs> I'll say in Spanish. Eh, le acabo de decir a Mary que una manera tal vez de describir contemplación es como cuando estás en un bosque y escuchas el sonido del, de los pájaros y te comienzas a, a meter en ese sonido para apreciarlo y tú mismo no te das cuenta que se te están yendo los pensamientos, lo que tenías en la mente, lo que fuera, no, ni siquiera te das cuenta que comienzas a fluir, a entrar en ese sonido y todo lo demás no está allí. Para mí eso es lo que la mejor manera que describía de describir la contemplación. Y eso es lo que le dije. Thank you. Thanks. Muy bien. Bueno, pues, pues muchas gracias, Irma. Y vamos a ir con eh, la que es la... Bueno, yo creo que vamos a hacer la, la última carta porque son ya las ocho y media. Y así eh, va a ser la última carta, la quinta, la dejamos para el siguiente. So we're going to do the last card because it's already 8.30 and we'll leave the last card for the next uh, retreat we have together. So the satsang is the, the search of, of, of one and it also came randomly. Ramón, creo que no has compartido el audio, ¿eh? Porque no se oye. About objective goals and subjective goals. The answer would be that there are subjective goals and there are objective goals. Now, what do we mean by subjective goals? And what do we mean by objective goals? A subjective goal is a goal self-created where we feel that we have to reach somewhere and that is normally led by one's mind which is always in a conditioned state the goal of man in life is to find freedom from that conditioning in other words that which binds us is mind and every person's mind is a patterned mind So what we are trying to do is unpattern the mind to bring it to its primary purity, which is the subjective goal 
of all human beings to reach again to the point where we had started from is the purpose of life. Good. Now, through all these various incarnations man has taken upon himself in the process of evolution, so many experiences have been accumulated. Now, many experiences have to be unexperienced. Hmm? Good. If a person has gone through severe pain, he has to learn to know what is painlessness. And by doing that, he produces within himself an equilibrium. It is like the two ends of a stick, to use that as an example, for the subjective goal of man, being conditioned by his mind, always functions in polarities. There is always a polarity. Hmm? So, on the one hand you'd have pain, on the other hand pleasure, on the one hand you have heat, on the other hand cold. In other words, man's mind and all the subjectivity as far as the goal is concerned, is further subjected by this polarity. Now what happens here and what should be done to realize the subjective goal is to bring about a balance. Hmm? And when that balance is brought about between the two opposite ends of the stick, then only can there be the equilibrium or tranquility. In other words, the stick has to be held right in the center, so the one does not overweigh. The scales are in perfect balance. Good. Now the subjective mind is always ruled by a very fine force that many of you might have read about called the gunas. Now there is no equivalent of the gunas as far as the, as far as science is concerned. But it is a fine force that keeps the entire universe in motion. You have Thomas, which is inertia, and darkness. And then you have Sattva, which is light. And the force that activates these two forces is the Rajas. In other words, Rajas is the activating force that keeps Tamas and Sattva in motion all the time. So, we are involved in this motion and there could be no evolution without motion. As we are sitting here, this little planet of ours, which is not even as big as a speck of dust as far as the universe is concerned, is hurtling through space. As you are sitting there, billions of cells are working within your body, within a certain framework, a precise framework, and there is continual motion in your system. Hmm? Certain motions are automatic. Uh, we call them motor functions. Hmm? And certain motions has to be by volition. Good. So the entire universe is nothing else but a mass of energy swirling around in a precise pattern of which you are a part. Hmm? And this entire motion is created by the three factors that we have mentioned. For without those three factors, there could be no motion. Now, the purpose of life is to create a, an equilibrium in the state of motion which gives us the stillness. And that is why all theologists would say, be still and know that I am God. For behind this motion, as the factor upon which this motion is established is that stillness, that unchanging 
stillness upon which all this motion is taking place all the time. So, the subjective goal of man is to return to the stillness from which he had primarily originated. The objective goal of man is one which he thinks that he can reach. He, sends an, he sets an object that he wants to reach from here to New York. Now, you can reach New York in so many different ways. You can go by aeroplane, you can go by motor car, you can go by a donkey cart. Hmm? Depends how fast you want to travel and how comfortably you want to travel. Right, so the object is there. Now, the position here is this, that the subject has to reach the object. Hmm? And when the subject reaches the object, neither subject nor object remains. What remains is the stillness. Now here two laws function in achieving this. One is free will and the other is divine will. Divine will would be that you have to reach New York. Free will would be your personal determination how you want to reach New York. Do you want to take a plane or do you want to take a motor car? Mm -hmm. And therein, as we discussed yesterday, lies the power of discrimination. The request, the research. Mm -hmm. Now, when we talk of search, you have so many titles of books. Search for God. Search for the inner self. Search for self-realization. Search for God-realization. These titles, if you study them carefully, are really meaningless. Hmm? Search for God. What is search? Hmm? And what is God? Without knowing the definition of the terms, all subjectivity and all objectivity becomes meaningless too. We have to have an idea of what search is all about why we are searching and what the end, what the goal is of the search. Now, you'd always find that you are pushed in circumstances. Now, there are two forces at work pushing you into those circumstances. The major force is that you have set yourself within this motion and you have to continue in this pattern until the momentum that has been set is brought to a standstill or the momentum is at an end. Hmm? The other part is firstly in creating the momentum. Hmm? It's like spinning a top. You spin the top, and when the top has reached its peak of spinning, it will unwind itself and become still again. The first part normally has to do with free will, with the freedom of thought. Well, what this suggests uh, to me, or or what's been left uh, behind, uh, behind, is that uh, constant uh, proposal from Gurus to search uh, equilibrium between concepts. Make it, for example. Uh, the relationships that I have uh, between another person and I, or, or work, or we usually tend to give uh, 
uh, responsibility to the external factors of our life without maybe realizing that we are also guilty of that uh, result and that work problem or that relationship problem. And when we accept that responsibility of what's happening to us, already it already changes uh, the way we focus on the problem. Because we are uh, usually put on the one side of the problem on the other side is what we name the problem and we must find that kind of equilibrium of what we find to be a problem and our self-responsibility on the problem and said by Guru Raj uh, which I think is something very very useful in in our lives and clarifying and very strong Maybe it's difficult to find that equilibrium, but it will always exist in front of us. We are responsible in somehow of what's going on in our lives, and we have to find that equilibrium point, uh, you know, not to give away anything because everything is okay as it is. Uh, but we must find that equilibrium within ourselves by finding responsibility. Uh, for me, I don't have much more to add on. Uh, but to remind us the question, who is searching and who is the object uh, that is being searching for? What is search and what is God? and understanding that search. What is the little eye looking for? The little eye is looking for its survival, its uh, perpetuation. And that's the pattern which is being uh, spinned through. That's the movement that is going to take. So once we decide uh, to break free from those thoughts let's say the the will will uh, go uh, to its own uh, way but it will finally stay still at the end once that the uh, energy of in inertia is broken uh, uh, it will finally come to an end but it has to uh, finish using up that energy of movement which it was pushed primarily for. So once you start on that search, you know, uh, that uh, inertia that was there from the beginning, which is that self I, you know, uh, surviving and, and perpetuating itself, it'll start losing inertia and it finally will stay still. And from that stillness, uh, like the Salmos used to say, be still and know I am God. Mm, not, nothing else. Or, or I will give a pass if anybody wants to give any kind of addition to this. It's uh, 9 o'clock in Spain, 3 o'clock in New York. If anybody wants to say anything, you're all welcome. Share or... Not to take up everybody's time, but thank you all very much for setting up this platform and doing what you're doing. It is a blessing to us all. And I thank you from the, my heart to yours. Thank you, my brother. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Merida, las gracias por poner esta plataforma, por hacer esta plataforma y por todas estas cositas que hacemos. ¿Alguien más quiere decir algo? Sí, pues yo también quiero dar las gracias. Me sumo y yo también quiero. I would also like to say thank you.
before we say goodbye, just say thank you to everyone. Eh, Ramón, eh, bueno, me sumo, eh. I would like to add on. Eh, uh, uh, there were all very, very interesting videos. Will this satsang be be uh, be placed somewhere to see? You'll be able to find it in the platform, in both platforms. You'll be able to see it in the group. So all you have to do is uh, go to all recordings and see the videos either in English or Spanish, depending on the platform. But we've recorded in both languages, so you, you'll be able to go back and and see this uh, satsang once again. Except the meditation. The meditation is not recorded, but the satsang is... Uh, thank you to everyone.